so rather muggy out. The weather is certainly a bit moorish, but I think you can already guess what I was about to say. Will it affect the pump? No. No. The only things that can potentially affect the pump are weather that breaks into the realm of, you know, I was about to say disaster, as if we're in the fucking One Punch Man world. No, um, emergency, right? Like snow emergency where they fucking, the roads get shut down. You really can't fucking drive without you know, risking being stranded. And even if the roads aren't that bad, and you can make a journey out to, you know, your planet fitness, which you think is 24 hours, but really isn't. So then you're just totally fucking screwed because there's nobody working there. And you just drove 30 minutes on what would usually be a five minute drive in the snow because you're trying not to crash. That's not ideal. That's not ideal. That's, uh, that's unfortunate. But I think those times are over. It's already fucking, it's nearly April. So no more worrying about inches upon inches of snow keeping me away from the gym. I should have, uh, there's a few 24 hour gyms with key fob access that are around me. That's what I really got to get on. I didn't get memberships to them until recently. So that's, uh, those have saved me. Those actually, those probably would have saved me if I, if I even thought about it before, but reasonably chill lift today because it's just hamstrings. Not that I'm going to like go easy on them. You know, I'm still going to hit them hard. But for me, training hamstrings doesn't really require much, I don't want to say effort, but I can pretty much do sets of hamstrings to what I feel is a pretty solid amount of fatigue and in some cases muscular failure with that too much difficulty, you know, like for me to do a set of leg extensions to absolute failure, that's pretty hard, right? My quads are... They're a pretty fucking strong muscle. They've got a lot of fucking... I might be getting kind of bro science here, but they've got a lot of slow twitch fibers and whatnot. So it takes a while to really fucking beat them to nothing. Whereas with hamstrings, a little more fast twitch. And again, this might just be mumbo jumbo, but whatever. I can get to a point where they just really won't fucking contract anymore pretty quick. So, you know, when I do a set of hamstring curls and I bust out partials at the end of it to the point where I can barely move the weight like an inch or so, that to me feels like I'm doing some good work. My hamstrings are sore, or they feel fatigued, they get pumped, and I can leave the hamstring pump and say yippee. Uh, but I definitely want to start incorporating more RDLs, so that's going to happen today, especially cable RDLs. Those are the ones I like the most. And it kind of sucks because, like, I don't love barbell RDLs for sure. Dumbbell is okay. Ooh, dumbbell is okay. Smith Machine's also okay. But cable, I feel, well, I just feel my hamstrings the most. Something about it. So at this gym, they have a, uh, a cable machine with the two independent arms. So I can put them both down low. You know, ankle level as low as they go and then stand on a little uh, like squat box so I can get a really good stretch uh, and I would uh, I'd recommend you recreate it there are a few machines that are just like that movement already fucking built into one thing where the platform adjusts up and down and then there's two cables on either side and I I'm not sure exactly what I like about it it's probably a combination of just the, you know, the feeling of the weights on a pulley system, rather than just pulling up the weight itself, like, you know, through space. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, like, a dumbbell curl with a dumbbell is going to feel different than a cable curl, even if the loading and, like, the weight is the same on either one. And, you know, that's just because you're not building up so much momentum with the cables. The tension's a little more constant. It's a little easier to muscle through a rep. Uh, you know, that's all I'm trying to say there. So, something about the cables, and then also the fact that I don't have to worry about running into my own shins. 
<clears throat> because you gotta remember, with like a barbell and a Smith machine, uh, my body weight, my center mass is, for the most part, right on my heels during RDLs. That's kind of like sort of standing in that way lets me contract my hamstrings the most. And if my center mass is on my heels, then the barbell kind of naturally wants to be right above my heels. But I can't. My shins are in the way. So the nature of doing them with a barbell, it's just a little funky for me. Um, I'm not sure that's like exactly the right explanation. But whether it is or not, it just doesn't really do it for me. So cable RDLs feel much better. Uh, unfortunately though, this cable machine, it's not that heavy. And I can't really load extra weight onto it. So for that reason. And then also I just feel better doing a little bit of seated hamstring curl or laying hamstring curl first. I'm going to save the RDLs for later once my hamstrings are already fatigued. You know, so if you get to a point where your pec deck at your gym, you can do the stack you know, for kind of an easy set, like above 15 reps or so, or even pushing maybe 20 reps, you're definitely not going to want to start with that pec deck because it's just not going to be an intense enough set, at least I don't think so. I think you're going to be better off doing some heavy pressing, maybe some other machines which you can really load up, and then once you're already fatigued, that stack, which you could do pretty easily when you're fresh, <clears throat> it's now a bit more challenging, you know. So in that sense, I do like the idea of making use of lighter weight by way of pre-exhaustion, like sort of following the logic. Oh. Oh, like half hiccups. Mm. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> oh, apologies. But, yeah, kind of following the logic of, like, your muscle doesn't know how heavy the weight is. It just knows how heavy it feels. So, by saving that movement for later, lighter weight will feel heavier. Because your muscle is a bit... It's in a weakened state. Now, of course, I don't totally believe that. Because I do... I mean... Your, your muscle may not know how heavy it fucking is, but you know how heavy it is. Right? Progressive overload is something I stand behind for sure. But I still know I'm going to burn my hamstrings to the point where I should get a fire extinguisher. And I'm going to have trouble standing with my legs completely straightened because my hamstrings are going to be so just full of fucking blood that they're not going to want to stretch that much. And I'll kind of have to walk around with a bit of a hobble. But that's the plan. That's a that's an ideal end state. So I think I'll probably start on the laying hamstring curl, just because that's the one I like the most. But <sighs> that's also that's also something that's to be determined, you know. Like I have a basic idea of what I want to do, but fuck man, what if I get in there and there's three guys on the seat of hamstring curl doing a circuit? And they're going to be there for a while. They're camped out. Am I going to wait 20 minutes or 15 minutes for them to be done? Or am I just going to be a reasonable human being and say, okay, let's adapt to this situation and do a different movement? Nine out of ten times, that is going to be the better move. So let's, uh, geez, I really took you on the whole drive here. Doesn't look too packed. Even if it is, who cares? Let's get started. I feel kind of silly with over ear headphones on, but I gotta make do. I um, I left both my little pairs of like in ear Beats at school at my school apartment, and uh, as much as I love them, I'm not gonna go all the way back there for them. So, I uh, somebody let me try these out before. They're the ones that kind of have like extra bass. Kind of cool, but whatever. So, the lift itself, I was getting ready to do some heavy sets of uh, hamstring curls, really throw some weight around. But something about it, it just felt a little off to the point where I think it's going to be a better move to start with single leg squeezing, kind of burnout style sets, where instead of, uh, instead of my typical fucking bouncing the weight around, putting a ton of tension on my hamstrings, these would be a bit slower. 
and it'll kind of burn out in more of a simmer. Like, instead of a set of hamster curls where I just fucking really throw the weight around super quick, where I kind of burn out in like a blaze, in a sense, where I hit failure pretty quick. Like, I go from like good rep, good rep, good rep, oh, half a rep, quarter rep. This, this one will be a, a slower sort of uh, descent to failure, as it were. But slow sets, lighter sets, squeezing sets, as long as they're all hard sets, I think you're good. And I think I'm good as well. Like a few more, just like that. One more like that, and then I'll switch to either double leg or maybe just cable RDL. I think, well, I think those were some good sets. Jesus, fuck. Very similar to yesterday's arm day. Making use of less weight than normal. Uh, now, of course, I'm still going to do my heavy sets, but I think maybe leaning towards the spectrum of lighter squeezing sets will not hurt me. That's for sure. Obviously, one end. Heavy ass sets, muscular failure, eight reps. The other end, stuff a little more like this. Slower, controlled, burn. But again, as long as it's a hard set, I think you're doing something right. So next, I don't know, next will be something. Maybe another set here, double leg, or maybe RDLs. I'm gonna take a moment to think about it. 
and get back to you. I'm gonna go a little lighter than the full stack, but this will be a double leg set, not so slow and controlled, much more so in a burnout fucking dirty set fashion. I'm still gonna squeeze, of course, but you know. One more, same style. And then already else. Ah. Way too heavy. Make a drop set. Time for RDLs. Fuck, the ham's already cooked. You know, I was about to say, you know, just a normal set of RDLs, nothing much to say. But there kind of is a little bit to say. RDLs are fucking tricky, man. It's not a super intuitive movement. Uh, I mean, I didn't do RDLs at all for fucking years. <coughs> at least not consistently. Just because I couldn't feel my hamstrings. It didn't really click with me. I couldn't really contract them manually so now i've got a little bit better technique and just from trying it over the course of time you do get better at it and you'll kind of you know get a knack for it but if i were to give you any cues or tips which may potentially help if for you you feel tons of lower back and glutes is my go-to is you know same thing with barbell or dumbbell or smith or whatever any rdl version i like to stand with my toes touching, my heels apart a little bit. So I'm kind of standing like fucking, I don't know, fucking weirdly, whatever. And then as I pull upwards, I'm almost trying to pull my knees together backwards as well. Like, I don't know. It's as though I'm trying to like, if these are my knees right here, I'm trying to pull them backwards and towards each other while at the same time, like, feeling like I'm trying to tuck my tail in between my legs. It's, it's definitely something which you'll just fucking be better off figuring out. Honestly, that was kind of a goofy explanation. But I think a few here, maybe back to some kind of hamstring curl, and that'll be it. I mean, fuck, man. There's nothing else to do. Oh my god, fuck. I think just one more of those, oh my god. Okay. I lied. One more of these. And that might just be it.
set of hamstring curls of some variety just to finish off the pump hamstrings complete well nearly oh my goodness okay lift lift complete I did not need another set of hamstring curls after that uh after just sitting for a second after that last set of RDLs yeah, that was all that was all that was necessary, I think. So, how are the hamstrings looking? Are they pumped? Are they unpumped? Are they totally fucking flat? And again, I'm, I feel like I'm just redoing the same trope I do every post lift, pose down. Yes, obviously they're fucking pumped. Let's just see to what degree, you know. Let's see just how pumped, and whether or not it makes me say. Holy shit, er, oh my goodness. Boy. But they definitely feel fucking swollen. I mean, just sitting here, like, straightening my legs completely. Oh shit. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm not sure if it translates well on fucking camera, but like, there's a serious, like, well, serious to me, roundness to the back of that fucking hamstring. Oh my god. Yeah, the lighting's cooler from this side. But yeah, that is, here, can we, uh, can we get a quick zoom in on that? There we go. Yeah, that is fucking cool. Yeah, so there's a fucking like, straight up kind of bulbousness to the back of the leg. Ooh, very nice. That's kind of the whole point of like side chest poses is you like squeeze your leg up against itself to make your hamstrings smush down and you know look extra fucking big. Ooh. Yeah, I love that. That's fucking killer. So right now my quads should look smaller than normal because my hamstrings are what are fully pumped. Oh, my quads are kind of well, fucking flat in comparison. But eesh. I mean yeah, that's a fucking hamstring that's befitting of, you know, that fucking Arnold pose for sure. At least for now. It's only going to get freakier from here. But let's, uh, let's have a quick little post-lift chat. Why the heck am I only doing hamstrings on their own? Why not a full leg day? Am I a baby? Well, let's find out. So, I've kind of noticed over the last period of time that... I like doing hamstrings before quads. So even in a, two days when I do quads, I am gonna warm up my hamstrings a little bit and get some blood into them. Not like I'm doing any working sets, but you know, maybe just do a few sets of light leg extensions, get them, just get them moving. But what happens is after I do a full fucking hamstring workout, I think I'm fatigued and I'm compromising my energy levels for quads to the point where like, I think I'm going to have a better quad day if I just emphasize quads themselves and save hamstrings for later. And I'm sure you may think, okay, we'll just do quads before hamstrings, valid point. But after quads, and this could just be me being a fucking wuss, but I want to be done. After quads, I say it's time to roll because quads are a big fucking muscle and I try to go all out. squats. Leg extension, sissy squat, drop sets, leg press, if I like the leg press, which is usually kind of rare. But at the, end of the quad, at the end of the quad lift, when I do that last set of leg extensions or sissy squats or whatever kind of superset, I want to be able to say, oh, oh, I'm all done. I'm finished. Let's get out of here. Let's check the quad pump and then roll. So based on those two constraints, those two facts, I think... I want to do a hamstring day and a quad day, at least for a while. You know, this is kind of a, not experimental, but only a temporary workout routine for me right now because I'm not even training back 
Uh, I'm going to go up like maybe another month or so with no back training just because, I mean, when I was training with Jacob, a fucking straight up IFBB pro, uh, that's one of the hostile Arnold Columbus blog lifts. We're doing a front, front double bind side chest and my arms are definitely behind, chest is definitely behind, but when I hit a fucking back lat spread, the lats are there. The width and thickness is there for the most part to the point where I think my legs and my arms and my chest need to come up. My two strong points right now, delts and back. So since they're my strong points, they're ahead of the game. I want to chill out on them and save energy or that's kind of the mentality, you know, save some of my body's energy to build muscle for everything else. Because I mean, I'm, this is kind of just bro science, but if I were to cut everything out of the equation and only do hard bicep training, you know, every fucking three days or so, like every three days, just come in, do an absolutely insane, obliterating bicep lift. Maybe not like, ins but a good bicep lift, leave, and then eat my normal food as, as usual, my biceps are gonna grow at a faster rate than they are right now. Of course, the rest of my body isn't, but that kind of specialization, it is gonna fucking, it's gonna result in specific muscle growth. You know, why do you think gymnasts have fucking bananas, biceps, and backs? It's because the majority of their fucking training is all like pull up action and fucking, you know, whatever else. And same thing with anybody. A fucking arm, a professional arm wrestler is gonna have massive fucking arms compared to their the rest of their body because that's what they train specifically. So it would make sense that anything you don't train will probably chill out, you know, not grow. If you're in a calorie surplus or even just maintenance, it's not really gonna shrink at all, at least not to any noticeable degree. So am I worried about back? Um, What's the, what's the word when your muscle breakdowns? Cata catabol catabolism? Back catabolism? Am I worried about my lats shrinking or my delts shrinking while I'm not hitting them? No. Because I'm eating a fucking banana's amount of calories. There's no chance I'm going to fucking eat into my muscle. So this is kind of my approach to bring up my weak points, as it were. But plan now is just go home, eat, a, eat another half pound of steak. My pre-workout meal was a half pound. It wasn't a ribeye, but it was it was kind of a fatty cut. Half pound of that, plus a bowl of uh, chicken ramen. Good amount of carbs, tons of sodium. I did drink a lot of water in combination with that. A uh, little bit of an anecdote. There's absolutely no problem with taking in grams of sodium per day, but that should be coupled with a serious amount of fucking fluids. You know, it kind of balances you out, makes you, you know, actually hydrated, not just fucking suck the water out of you. Uh, but feel nice and strong. I can tell I'm still a little bit, let's just say, impaired from traveling. So that was maybe why I wasn't so crazy with hamstrings. But really good lift. They're fucking pumped. I'm ready to go home and eat. So let's get out of here. Oh my goodness, you can just stand it up for the fucking sore. Good. Yeah, freaking, you know, usually I would think that I'm only going to have to limp down the stairs when my quads are pumped up, but even walking down the steps today with hamstrings destroyed, I was, I had to use caution. I had to, I had to take each step very methodically. I mean, not like I was about to fall over, but you know what I'm saying. If your legs have ever been fatigued to the point of... Let's just say instability, where you get a little, just a little nervous when you're going down the steps. You use a little bit of extra care, almost as if they're like slippery. You make sure each step is very, uh, very thought out. I've never done it before, but <laughs> I'm sure it would not take much to just throw me down those two flights of steps if I, like, if my knee buckled or something. Because there's not much to fucking... I mean, let's think about this. How much fucking potential energy is in this system when I'm at the top of, you know, 20 feet of consecutive steps? 20 feet, that's, uh, that's like, what, five meters? Maybe six meters? And I'm about 100, 
10 kilograms times 9.8. Fuck man, that's a lot of energy. And in a more real sense, not even looking at it from the math, let's just say that would fuck me up. So that would affect the pump. Or at least it would definitely affect the recovery of the lift. Uh, as, um, as embarrassing as it is to say. Actually, no, it, it's not embarrassing. This is conducive with gains. There's an elevator at that gym. A few steps around the corner, and instead of going up the stairs, you take the elevator. And I take that thing all the fucking time. I don't know why I didn't take it today on the way down. But I definitely took it on the way up. What are you going to do? What are you going to do, man? If there's a... Take the path of least resistance, I say. Except for when it comes to your training. That's when you're going to want to take the path of most resistance. But, yeah, hamstrings wrecked. I'm not... I'm kind of conflicted a little bit. Because I think that my left hamstring looks cooler, especially in, like, side poses. Like, when I do that kind of side, like, chest or tricep... I think my left hamstring looks cooler, but it's smaller slash weaker than my right one. Like, every time I did a set of single leg curls, I did my right one first. Wait. Actually, no, does that make sense? I can't remember. Either way, I think my left hamstring has kind of better insertions than the right one, at least for like kind of posing. And I'm not exactly certain why that is. My knees are at slightly different angles. Like, my left knee, compared to my right one, has a slightly different camber to it, which sometimes on some calf and hamstring machines makes me feel a little bit more comfortable doing one leg at a time rather than both at once, because sometimes I feel like I bias the right one a little bit more than the left one, or vice versa. So... Anytime you have kind of a, just like a biomechanic imbalance like that, and not, I'm not talking like one muscle is bigger than the other. I mean, like maybe one elbow kind of bends at a different angle than the other one. So doing preacher curls with both arms at once doesn't feel natural for you. With movements like that, where if you notice something like that on your build, yeah, just kind of stick to single-sided stuff. For the most part, I try to stick to double-sided movements um, in general, just because, I mean, you know, it's really, it's just fucking faster. It's more efficient for me to do a set of bicep curls or for me to do an arm day where I do both arms at once on pushdowns and curls rather than, you know, one arm, one arm, one arm, one arm. I mean, I'm literally doing twice the amount of work, at least time wise, doing single-sided stuff than I am when I do double-sided movements. But then, you know, thinking about it the other way, I get to focus on each side individually, and you know, instead of splitting up my focus between, you know, flexing each bicep, I guess I just do one and then the other. So, kind of, you can kind of argue either case. But, yeah, sometimes I like single-sided, like with those hamstring curls in the beginning, uh, lighter just so I could really squeeze each one to failure. And then, you know, uh, some movements just fucking require double leg loading, like the RDLs. I see single leg RDLs done sometimes, but that's just... That looks a little bit unstable to me, to the point where I don't think it's... Uh, I don't think it's something I need to really delve into much. But, yeah, hamstrings wrecked. I think... I was thinking this halfway through this hamstring lift. I'm pretty sure that today was supposed to be a quad day based on the split that I wanted to do because I think I was supposed to do legs or quads, chest, hamstrings, arms. So instead of quads, I did hamstrings today. So I think I'm just going to roll with it. So now that means I'm going to go hamstrings, chest, quads, arms. And that will be the order from here on out. And that's not a split I would necessarily recommend to everyone because there's no back or shoulder training. Uh, but I am going to try it for a little while because I think relative to everything else, 
my legs are weak, my arms are weak. My chest isn't weak, but I, I want it to be bigger. And by relative to everything else, I really just mean it relative to my strong points. You know, like when I bust out a lat spread, that shit's pretty fucking wide. But a side chest, without a pump, I want some more thickness. Same thing with a front and back double bicep. I want like, more roundness to the triceps and everything else. So by taking out back and shoulders, which are pretty, I mean, combined, that's a pretty substantial amount of fucking muscle. That's a little bit more energy I can use, you know, recovering and growing, ideally, everything else. So that's, uh, I mean, I already said this in the pose down, but that's kind of my approach right now. Not like a complete way of the giant pumpkin, uh, Devin Larratt style. That's where, uh, I don't know how well known or well used that phrase is, but in arm wrestling, if somebody, i making a lot of arm wrestling references today, but professional arm wrestlers, they don't need to compete with both arms. Right? They got the right-handed side and the left-handed side, or you know, right-handed competitions and left-handed competitions. So some guys just have a freakishly larger right arm, and they just train that one specifically, and they don't even mess with the other one. So the right arm is just fucking jacked, and the other one is like completely normal looking, quagmire style. So, you know, following that logic, muscles that get trained are going to grow, and muscles that don't, won't. So if I chill out on my back and shoulder training, they're going to stay the same size. And my logic is everything else will catch up, or at least a little bit. I mean, I'm only doing this for like a month, maybe a month and a half before I decide to keep doing it. Uh, a month, and month, month and a half is not a huge amount of time muscle building wise, but it is long enough where I should start to see a little bit of development uh, as long as I, you know, keep my calories up and I stay in a good surplus, which so far I have been doing, <sighs> so far I have been doing pretty well. So I don't see why, I mean, not even I don't see why I know there is still growth to be had this bulk. And if I didn't, then I would stop the bulk, die it down for a little bit, and start fresh again. So that's kind of my cue. And considering that with this bulk specifically, I have had a little bit of a different approach than normal. Um, in previous bulks, or I guess you could call it off seasons, uh, I jumped straight to a crazy amount of calories and I just keep it locked right there. Like I try to eat like 5,000 onward. I don't really adjust it or anything. I just stay there because I know it's a surplus. And that was my logic. You know, I want to eat a ton of calories as quick as possible, put on as much weight as quick as possible. Uh, and I did. My weight fucking skyrocketed up to like 250, 250 something. But then I just couldn't break past a fucking 250 barrier, you know, because I think I oversaturated myself calorie wise. So now with this one specifically, the first few months, uh, or the first two months, really eased into it. Uh, like, I didn't just jump straight to a crazy amount of calories. Honestly, the first month going from dieting, where I limited myself to about, like, 2,500 to, like, the first 30 days of the bulk, all I was really eating was just as much as I was hungry for. And that wasn't a ton. I was doing, like, 3,000, like, a little more than 3,000 calories. And then over the course of time, from then to now, I've gradually increased and increased and increased it up to like upper fours, about 5,000. So that's put me up to the 260 mark-ish. Of course, I gotta, I need to get back up to that weight. I'm kinda, I kind of had a little bit of a dip after the whole Arnold UK trip. Uh, but yeah, around 260 is the full bulked weight right now, which once I get back to, I'll you know, be back up at where I want to be. And that's fucking 10 pounds heavier than the peak was before. Like on the last bulk, if I were to go a few days with scrappy eating or go on like a big trip like I just did, my weight would be at like 240. Like 240 would be my light weight. So now after fucking a few days of kind of scrappy, not scrappy training, but definitely scrappy recovery, like my sleep was kind of jacked because we were doing so much stuff. And then I wasn't eating enough food. And I'm not, I'm not saying that as an excuse. I'm just saying like, as a matter of fact, that is what happened. My light weight was 250. And I, I kind of said that like very somberly in like two videos ago. I'm like, fuck, I'm 250, shit. 
But you gotta remember, 250 is fucking heavy, man. So, only more to come. But yeah, so the next, honestly, it's almost as though the bulk is really only starting now, you know? Like, now is when I'm actually really starting to ramp up the calories and eat seriously to the point where I'm actually, like, having to plan out, like, okay, I need to eat at least 3,000 calories by 1 o'clock so that I don't have to force feed later on. Like, stuff like that. Like, it's actually starting to really kick into gear now. So, you know, another few months. And as long as I keep gaining weight steadily, or at least reasonably steadily, the bulk's not going to end, you know? The only way that I'm going to say, all right, let's, let's start the cut. It's time to diet down. I need to take a break from bulking up. Is this my weight plateaus, you know? Uh, I don't necessarily have a limit on the length of the bulking phase, as long as it's fucking working, you know? So the last bulk was only two, I mean, nearly a year, kind of like a third of a year, eight months or so. Amen. If in three months I'm still gaining a little bit of weight, even like, you know, pound every few weeks, I'm going to keep pushing. Unless I, you know, for whatever reason, come to the conclusion, all right, I got to chill out. Let's back off the food, let's reset, let's diet down, see where I'm at, and then come back fresh again. So, if you like the bulking videos, then you're in luck, because they are not going anywhere soon. Not freaking anywhere. And that's fine by me. I love getting heavier, because that means I'm really making tangible progress. Like, I like dieting down. It's cool, it's fun to be fucking lean and diced and I, I don't say that like like oh you know it's kind of cool like it is fucking cool hosing down really lean like thin skin on my stomach abs are fucking going nuts veins all over the place that is really fucking sick and I love it but I also understand the fact that if I want to get to there if I want to get to that state bigger than I was last time then I've, I've got to grow first you know you can't just jump straight to a fancy paint job. I've, uh, I've said this analysis before. You can't just throw a fancy ass paint job on a beater and suddenly it's going to be sick. And what I mean by that is if you're kind of a beginner, you're kind of a intermediate lifter, then just really dieting down and getting super lean um, every so often, no problem with it. But for that to be your end goal, like to just be a lean 160, Fuck, man. I think you're aiming too low. You know? So, it's cool to be lean. Everybody loves having abs. Uh, it's just fucking... I mean, it's cool. But, look, man. At the cost of a few months of having a little bit higher body fat than normal, as well as having to deal with eating in a calorie surplus, which for some people can be kind of a fucking hassle. Right? At the cost of that, to diet down in the future and be extra fucking lean... I fucking love it. So, it's uh, maybe you should implement a little bit more delayed gratification and uh, you know, build up some muscle, build up some serious beef first, and then diet down to show it off. Uh, but then again, that's just me. Main gain all you want if it works. So, plan now is to eat, eat, eat some more, and go to sleep the perfect end to the day of a lifter. So I'll see you tomorrow for chest. I love chest day.